So I'm actually going to take a little bit of a step back, actually, Beverly, um, and I'm going to just pick up on what you're talking about the different generations. So this is this is the starting point. If you are running a business, then you need to be aware that there are now many, many stakeholders. So I think we've. I want to move away from this idea about just customers and clients. That's, you know, if you run a business, it's all about customer clients. It's now about stakeholders. You have many, many stakeholders. So I'll just go through some of those stakeholders. Clearly customers and clients are important. Past clients, prospective clients, staff, prospective staff, investors, suppliers, influencers, journalists, um, policy makers. All of these are stakeholders. If you have an organization, you need to be able to communicate with all those different stakeholder audiences effectively. Each of those audiences, as we've seen, communicates entirely differently. For me, a, an interesting year is 1980. 1980 was the, if you like, the crossover year. If you were born before 1980, you are a traditional communicator. You remember the old world. You remember analog, you remember phones, you remember offices without computers on the desk. Just blows people's minds. If you're born after 1980, then you are a digital native. And it's important when you are talking, um, if you are consulting a business or if you are running a business, you need to be aware of all the different stakeholder groups. So let me give you an example. I spoke to a solicitor, had a large law firm, and he told me that most of his clients were baby boomers. Now we know that baby boomers like to speak on the phone. They like to be treated with respect, uh, use formal language. And then all the staff within the firm were all millennials. The millennials do not like using a phone, use much more colloquial language like, hey, how are you doing? Um, and the takeaway for him from the workshop I ran was that he was going to have to reverse engineer his millennial staff and train them old school on how to use a telephone effectively so that his millennial staff could then talk to his clients properly. So that's a perfect example, if you like, of where you've got uh, an issue around intergenerational communications. But as, as Beverly pointed out earlier, these segments, these generations all communicate, think differently. So that impacts so many areas. It impacts recruitment. It impacts web design, customer service. Um, it impacts upon internal communications and training. Um, it's communications has now risen right to the top of the pile within organizations. And, and those organizations who cannot communicate effectively internally don't have a prayer of communicating externally. So that's something we, really We important. find this, so, don't we, Dave? We find this so much when we've got, uh, it's that intergenerational um, uh, groups in, inside companies. And certainly when I go in there, and this is what they're saying to me, is how can I get everybody to communicate better? And that's a lot to do with culture as well. So cultural change sometimes has to happen um, in order for that to, uh, that whole thing to gel forward. Um, and this is something that I'm certainly hearing at the moment. Um, so, with that in mind, I'm going to now, um, I've talked about Lloyd's, and uh, a, a while back, Lloyd's came up with their um, essential digital skills framework, and Lloyd's recognised that there are six areas within a business where you need to implement digital change. So clearly communicating is a large area. You've got creating, 
managing information, problem solving, transacting, and cybersecurity. So six absolutely key areas which you be, need to be looking at within a business. Now, I'm, now Beverly and I are, are talking now specifically around leadership within business. So it's not a case of communicating, oh, well, I've got an agency and they do it, or, oh, I've got an IT department. You need to be taking a much more macro level view. So what I've done is I've picked out, I'm not, I'm not going to go all the way through this because there's so many different elements and this is going to form the basis of what Beverly and I are doing over the coming weeks and months. But I've picked out eight specific areas which I just want to, to, to touch on. And uh, Beverly, I'm sure, will be interjecting with some of her own experience and background. So first one is digital ambassadors. Now, digital ambassadors, um, this is a, I, I guess, a, a new concept. Um, what it means is that these are people who know, like, and trust an organization. They could be internal, they could be external. So if they are internal, they are members of your team, members of staff, they could be freelancers, they could be consultants, who are actually um, very, very keen to promote the brand. And they themselves will have their own platforms. This is, this is a, a really important point, which we haven't emphasized just yet. There's been a seismic shift in the way that human beings communicate. Before, if you wanted to communicate to a mass audience, you needed a vehicle to do that. You needed a gramophone or a radio transmitter or a newspaper or a magazine or a printing press. But now you just need this and that enables mass communication. So to paraphrase Marx, it's about a democratization of the means of communication which has taken place. We don't need the BBC. We don't need the local paper. We've got ourselves. And everyone now is a publisher. Everyone is a broadcaster. Everyone has their LinkedIn or their Instagram or their blog or their YouTube channel. So the brand ambassadors are an army of people who've got all of their own um, tech and all of their communications. And the digital ambassadors can make a huge difference to the way that your business is seen, either positively or in fact, negatively. So there are clearly, there will be people who are dark ambassadors who, who hate you and uh, will go out their way to rubbish you online. Uh, and again, that that's the, uh, as with everything, there's always a dark side, but uh, um, Beverly and I aren't interested in the dark side. We're, we're only interested in the light. So digital ambassadors, again, so a takeaway from today, <clears throat> is if you're working with a business or you're in a business, you need to identify internally and externally who are the digital ambassadors. And the sad truth often with large businesses is that the senior management team and the board are not ambassadors themselves, which is amazing. They are the key, they are the most important part of the real estate of that brand, yet they don't, they can't be bothered to promote it. And why is that, David? And the reason for that is isn't because we talk at this, we talk at C-suite level all the time is because they actually are scared of technology, don't understand it, don't want to appear to not know it. And um, and this is where, you know, this is where I come in, I guess, and sort of talk to people about how that's achievable. Um, and it's not a scary place as they think it is. Um, and, you know, it's this whole area of communication that you're talking about, these ambassadors how often people still say, oh, please don't, don't text me or don't message me, you know, phone me up, tends to be still those older um, age groups, you know, in the, uh, that, that like to communicate through, through discussion. Um, and sometimes, you know, when you just send a quick text off or a quick message, um, it's, and it needs to be done in the right way. So by training people how to present those messages so that people understand it, 
um, and to be quite clear um, in, in that communication as those ambassadors across whatever media they're using. That's what I'm that's what I'm hearing. They don't they're not being clear. People aren't being clear in their communication. Uh, I, I, and I think you're absolutely right, Beverly. And, and again, an issue is is gender and age. Mm. So gender. I we know that a lot of the people running businesses in this country are men and they're men of a certain age. And you're absolutely right, Beverly, they can't or won't change what they do. And, and, and I've, I've faced this with LinkedIn, some you know, a successful businessman in his 50s, why the bloody hell do I want to go on LinkedIn and just tell everyone what I'm up to? They, 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 it, it's anathema and it, it goes against what they've done over their careers, but we live in changing times and with changing times come changing ways of doing business and communicating. So the second one I want to touch on, which, which is often overlooked or deemed to be a, a um, manual which sits on a shelf somewhere, it's corporate level social media. Uh, and this is, this is taking the brand ambassador thing to a much wider degree. So let's take, for example, you have a company of a hundred people. The social media strategy isn't just, oh, we're on Facebook and Instagram and we've got a um, couple of nice youngsters who do it for us and that's it. The corporate level social media should include every single stakeholder within the business. So I've trained finance directors in using LinkedIn. Um, I've trained um, people in uh, contact centers oh. to start creating oh, videos. Yeah, I'm just listening to Beverly's webinar. Can you, can uh, everybody, please, can you, mute, please, can, you, please can you mute your, your screen, please? Can we mute, mute our screens? Thank you. So the corporate level social media includes every single member of staff within a business. And I, I've successfully worked with organizations where I've been doing one-to-one -one training around key individuals within the business. And this starts going into the area where, where again, I, I know that Beverly has experience, is looking at the idea of personal branding. So you've got, if you've hired someone who's good at their job, then that they clearly are an asset to the business. They have their own brand and therefore it should be encouraged that they start embellishing their own brand rather than, oh, I don't want them going on LinkedIn, they'll be poached, which is a very backward looking. So uh, personal branding, and again, Beverly, I, I know that this is something that, that you've done quite yeah. a lot of work around and it, it's important now, isn't it? It is indeed because it's like when it's like when you make your statement and and actually the, one of the the things that David reminds me quite often is about social media diarrhea, isn't it, David? And uh, you know, and sharing people's inf uh, posts and doing all of those things. But you've also got to look after your own personal brand. So personal brand, I always think, is very much if if you think about when we were allowed to uh, have a party. <clears throat> and you walk down the stairs in your lovely evening dress or guys in their tux and you go, wow, they look really nice. But it's when they get close to you and it's when they start having a look and the cut of the tuxedo is, is beautiful or the, the lining in a dress is something even better. And it's taking it, it's stripping it right back to that level is everything has to be really spot on. So um, this, this whole thing about personal branding, it, which is in your business, is also you as an individual or your directors in companies who actually need to take that thing a little bit further to make sure that what's going out there is, is sharp, is crisp, and is getting that message across. So the digital ambassadors, the different age groups that we've talked about, um, the key individuals, everybody needs to be aligned. And this is all about culture. It's about, it's about changing uh, ways of thinking. Um, and, um, you know, and it's something that I'm certainly very, very interested in. So, uh, the, the the corporate level social media and the people that we're actually talking to uh, need to be aligned. I think that's the sort of the key really with what's going on further down the business and what people are actually putting on social media because it only takes one person to spoil the party. 
and uh, therefore that's a cultural issue um, to to enable businesses to flourish. And which which also touches on another area which we're not going to talk about today, but that's why there need to be very very comprehensive, proactive, positive, empowering social media guidelines for yes. teams and people. Yeah. Next on the list is content. So I I mentioned about. Isn't it wonderful? We're all publishers, we're all broadcasters. Fabulous. And it's a little bit of a Faustian pact. Obviously, Faust sold his soul to the devil. And uh, the devil here being the social media company is saying, oh, look, we're going to give you these platforms, but we're not going to tell you what to post on them. And if they, if it isn't interesting, it's not our fault if no one enjoys it. So any organisation now needs to be thinking about content reservoirs. Um, and, you know, even if it's a startup or if it's a multinational like Coca-Cola, they're thinking constantly about content. You've got all these channels, you've got all these audiences, you've got all these customer journeys and pathways and calls to actions. It's really critical that businesses now start to think more like publishing houses and TV production companies than in the past, because you need lots and lots and lots of quality content and it's quali quality content, which is going to engage with the audiences which Beverly has just spoken about. So if you're engaging Gen <laughs> Zs or Alpha, so absolutely TikTok, Reels, all of these things which make my skin crawl, but then I'm a 51 year old man, so it's not designed for me, but absolutely, if you've got Gen Z and they're your customers and they're all your audience, how on earth are you gonna create content for a Gen Z audience? Equally, if, you've, if your audience are veterans, and we didn't touch on veterans, these are people born before 45, many of them, by the way, are on social media, then you need to be looking old school. And uh, always it's about thinking about how you're going to create content. And that's, uh, uh, again, we're living in an age where there's lots and lots of new roles being carved out. And in, within larger organizations, you will have someone who will be called head of content. They won't be the marketing manager. They won't be the social media manager. They will be, their job will simply be like a librarian to hold the keys to a data library, uh, to a to content library. Um, and they will be using that. Beverly. Yeah, this is something that I talk to people about all the time. So in my mentoring, when I go into companies and they say, what should we do? How should we do it? And I think that what you just said is to have that multi-age group uh, information going out there. And I usually sort of break it down into four areas. People can use this as a takeaway. I'm <clears throat> quite happy for them to, to borrow it. So you've got statistics and information. You've got stories, uh, blogs, things like that. You've got an advertisement about what you do, like your sales. You know, if you want to, um, if you're selling a bed, have you got a bad back? It's, it's actually meeting the pain point, isn't it? Uh, what beds have I got to help you to get a bad back and what's the benefit to you? So that whole sales tool um, is, 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 is a way of creating media. So David always puts it uh, in a quite a succinct way, which I really like, which is think about your audience as reading a magazine from your business. And in your magazine, uh, you see, David, I do listen, is, is all about that. So every page you turn over has got something different on it that will encompass all of those people that we've just talked about. You've got to be thinking about how that message is getting across. So um, even if you split your business marketing into four areas, stats, blogs, uh, ads, and, um, and information, then you're, you're, you're sort of getting yourself halfway there really. So I really love the magazine analogy. So thanks for that one, David. And linked into that then, um, if we are, the two of the key things I've talked about having digital ambassadors and corporate level social media and then content reservoirs, you start putting those together and you think, well, realistically, the only way that we can actually deliver on all of that is if we start creating 
a newsroom analogy. Yeah. Uh, one thing I always say is that any bit of experience you ever build up in your career is always of use. Even if you hated a job, even if you had a bad experience somewhere, it is still a valuable experience to build up. Years ago, I sat at a manual typewriter in Reading at the Reading Chronicle. I had a spike on my desk and a hot metal press around the corner. You would think that that's got absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking about today. However, I, I worked within a newsroom and the, the principles of that have not changed. The interesting thing, um, and I know that um, we've got Paul Miller on the call today. Um, I've been working with uh, a company called Sovereign Centros. And what we've done is we've drawn asset managers and development managers who, let's be fair, are not marketing or comms people, but we've brought them together and we've brought them together with the PR manager and we brought them together with an external um, marketing um, agency. And what we've done is we've created an internal newsroom. And this is where a group of people come together once a week and what they will do is they will discuss news, what's going on, and how they can create the content they need to drive that forward. And that's, that's a very, very new scenario. And it's what, <laughs> what we're recognizing is that the brand ambassadors can also be reporters. Beverly, any, any thoughts around that? Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so on the call today is my digital manager. She's called Jane Cordell. So thank you very much for keeping us all up to date there, Jane, with all the little messages and everything. Jane says the metal spike in hot press sounds like medieval torture, actually, David. But there you go. And and the thing is about having a newsroom analogy is that um, it's imagine being on the BBC World Service and all of a sudden this piece of paper lands on your desk in front of you and you've got to deal with it. So it's got to be that really quick thinking as well is, is at, the brand ambassadors need to take on board new information and get that out relevant to their particular business. Um, <clears throat> so the whole metal spike and hot press <clears throat> is actually quite real still, even, even now, <clears throat> excuse me, without the BBC World Service, you know, sort of uh, getting our stuff out there. Uh, we've constantly got to be up to date. So our new alphas, these transformers, these young people that are coming up behind, will be able to do this quite quickly because they're constantly seeing information sort of pitching up. So um, I, I, the, the whole brand ambassador thing is is so key, I think, across um, uh, the whole thing, the content pool, um, the, the, you know, the corporate level social media is to be able to take topical and news information and get that out quite quickly. Um, and as you rightly say, that comes through um, proper policies, uh, which I think is what you're going to touch on next, David. So um, absolutely. So when we're looking at um, the policies within the organization, you've got to have, as I said, very strong social media guidelines, but also you need to be looking at data. And I mentioned earlier about new roles appearing in businesses. So you could have a head of content, but I do think you're going to end up with a head of data. Someone's role will be to manage data within the organization. For those of you who are, have, um, sleepless nights and cold sweats about the mention of GDPR. And that was just the start of it really. Um, and now it's about understanding that data is the life force which flows through organizations. And there needs to be very, very strong data policies. Data is, is let's face it, quite dry subject. However, if you're doing a social media campaign, there's loads of data which comes out of it. If you have a website, there's data which comes out of it. If you've got relationships with clients, there's data which comes out of it. If you're following a hashtag, hashtag mad Trump, for example, that's data. There will be people talking about that. You can extract that data. Where does that data sit? What do you do with it? How safe is that data? What, what information can you make out of it which you could learn what data you lacking. It's data, data, data. And it, it is so, so important. Um, I read um, something very, very scary, which was a few years ago, there are two sorts of businesses, those businesses which 
had been hacked and had a loss of data and those which hadn't. We're saying that now there are businesses who know that they had a data breach and have been hacked. And there are those who don't know that they have already lost data. So data is, is absolutely key. Um, just a few days ago, it was it was uh, came out that the Home Office has lost a load of records, a load of data. Um, it, it's so important. It, it again, it it could be seen to creative people like me who just want to flounce around having big ideas that data is is in some ways dull, but the data is as important to the business as the P and L. Um, and if you do not get a hold on data, then you, you really are sunk. Um, and Beverly, I, I, the businesses you're talking to, how are they dealing with data? Or is it just seem to be a headache which they would rather not think about? I think I think it's the analytics of that data actually is what they're going to use it for, and that what that's what tends to come up. So um, certainly on our academy site, um, if a company's got 17 employees that are on a training course. Um, and they've accessed that uh, to, to complete it. You know, it's the information that you give back to the company. So it's how many people have actually finished that information, you know, that course, where did they stop in the course? And, um, and using that data and information can then help companies to, you know, to look at better ways of, of maybe training their staff, or they may want to, you know, if they've got six lessons in there, change lesson four, because nobody's getting past it. You know, so that whole data and that information section, um, I think that online and with analytics, it's like Google Trends, Google AdWords, Google everything, isn't it? If you haven't got a Google My Business page, you're not even at the starting point because that's how you actually get that data up and information going on anyway. So it's the data that comes from the social media that's been put out, which is the useful information. Um, and isn't it, isn't it strange how still we just don't even think about that Google My page? You know, um, and uh, and getting that very basic thing right with the SEO, which is something that is constantly changing as well to enable us to actually to take that data, David. And I, I think so. Moving on, um, I have um, I have this vision in the in the next few years. If you're a business owner or you're a, you're you're a part of a senior management team, you're going to end up with two dashboards. One dashboard will show your financial performance. Yeah. The other dashboard will show your digital performance and it will show all the data relating to the business. Naturally, you'll be merging those two dashboards. So you could actually take whole customer journeys from someone seeing a reel or a fleet or a message on Instagram and then going through to a page and then spending time on that page and then going to other pages and then going to a YouTube video and then doing a sign up and then um, going further and buying a product. And then you could then see have they bought that product on repeated times, which you then see to see an increase in sales. And therefore that gives an overview. And what we're looking at is much more integrated systems where you're integrating the data, you're integrating the comms, you're integrating the financial performance, and you start using all sorts of time-saving devices like Slack, et cetera, to, to understand how you can have a much more integrated and digitized business. And that's where um, you get much more sort of understanding. I mean, again, it, it still fascinates me how few business owners have never looked at the analytics of their own website. Hmm. So if their website was their shop window, what they're saying is, I have no idea how many people came in the shop. I had no idea how many people bought. I have no, I many, no idea how many people came to the shop from seeing something somewhere. And they're woefully in the dark. And, and I, I, I think senior management team, they must be looking at analytics monthly. They must be looking at the performance of their channels monthly to see, and they must understand what it is. So again, I know marketing and, and, and advertising agencies will deliver reports and secretly, you know full well, no one rounds the table has a, has a clue what that report means. 
<laughs> All they want to do is, oh, did we get likes this week? Well, likes are meaningless. Mm -hmm. So it, it's about having a much more integrated, digitized, sophisticated um, office, which, which, is, which is absolutely key. And um, I did actually see on a LinkedIn uh, report this morning about different age, uh, sorry, different uh, jobs that have come up out of uh, the last 12 months and lockdowns is e-commerce. Um, and there's a company called Buy, I think, which is just set up in, in Bournemouth, which is absolutely taking Amazon um, a storm um, for their uh, business. And also you've got uh, a data processing people and that's come out of this report as well. I'll send it to you later. But it's um, it's really interesting to see the you know the the change in the shift and people wanting to get online, uh, you know, uh, uh, parcel delivery people as I've just had myself, uh, you know, th they've all sort of um, engaged and become sort of larger business areas and certainly more jobs now available. Um, but this whole this whole digital information. You know, it's okay saying, oh, we had a 350 people on our platform mm -hmm. last month, you know, which we which we did because we've got the analytics for it. It's how we're using that information, how actually you're integrating with it. So quite right, David, when I look on LinkedIn and somebody says, this is a really great thing. And somebody's maybe somebody that I'm mentoring will say something like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, is to actually get your own thought leadership out there. So thank you. And, you know, or to to add some additional comment. So that's the content and that's where you'll get picked up from the the newsroom people uh, will actually um, just let me let somebody else in uh, and enable people to um, uh, to use that information to to help them to develop their business to the next level. So just to to two two more I just want to touch on which are actually quite linked to and they, they build on what we've just been talking about and it's the idea about creating innovation hubs within a business and, and Beverly's talked um, about culture and the most successful businesses now are the ones who are constantly evolving, constantly changing, inspiring um, people lower down uh, the managerial chain to come up with ideas and creating the environment I mean, we, we can talk blithely about um, putting the bean bags in the office and taking the desks away and having pinball machines and lots and colours and, and um, rap music playing at ear, ear bleeding volume. And everyone can sort of just get creative. You know, that was, that was very much millennial, very much noughties, et cetera. But, but I do think this idea, and I've, I've read there are some multinationals where the R&D team sit in a different building. They don't have to wear the same clothes. They don't have the same um, standard procedures. They are allowed to go and be creative. Um, and the flip side of that, I used to work for a, um, a property marketing company, and I had a whole team of designers working with in, in a nondescript dull office building off Oxford Street. And it's the most uncreative environment. It's difficult to be creative when you're not. So the idea of an innovation hub is key, but also it's about empowering the most important asset that any business will ever have, which is the human beings within it, the human capital. And this is a this whole COVID um, whole nightmare which we're going through is is giving us an opportunity to look again at what is a business and how it performs but looking again at the people and what we've seen is that many many people have risen to the challenge lots of managers said over my dead body will I, will ever there be home working they realize for 10 months the business has been more profitable and they haven't seen any of their staff who've all been working from home there are Fabulous people working with any business. And, and again, um, I've, I've been um, very fortunate to work with two businesses. One where um, I've taken a secretary and trained them up to be the community manager and then the marketing manager. I've worked with another business where we've had someone working in the contact center who's ended up being a videographer and creating this fabulous studio within the insurance company. 
And again, it's inspiring people. There are lots of people in the workforce who have innate skills. What are they? Are there secret skills they don't have? Are they able to take pictures? Are they able to take video? Are they able to speak in front of a camera? So it's, it's inspiring. It's uplifting. It's innovating. It's everything that Beverly talks about. Yeah, the, um, the, 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 uh, there's a whole bunch of software at the moment that's available for people to be able to, to look at all this whole uh, customer journey. I know we've got Shay on the call today and Shay has a company which is called um, A Better Place to Work, which actually looks at what everybody's actually uh, achieving within their role. And it will also take ambassadors to uh, to help managers to, um, you know, to, to perform in their workplace. Um, and also Keith, um, who is online uh, this morning, has just put a message in the box. Keith Brimley, hello. Um, talking about user and customer experience. And I this week have been speaking to two companies, UX um, and, um, and how you can actually do that and how easy are things like how easy is a website to look at, all of those sorts of things. And it's, it's actually really exciting to actually look at your user journey um, and, uh, you know, and, and how you can actually use that information to move, your, uh, move yourself forward. So these innovation hubs um, are, are coming out of change, out of culture, out of uh, you know, the, the newsroom analogy, the marketing and everything else that we help companies to put together, you know, troubleshooting it, I think, from, uh, from the board down. So it isn't just the board instructing the marketing department to do it. We've, everybody's got to be involved in that. Um, and um, I think that's moving you on to your next uh, part, David, which is about integrated systems, I think. Um, well, no, I, th I think I've, I've, I've covered that earlier, Beverly, and I'm, I'm conscious also that we're, we're coming up to the 11 o'clock shut-off time. So mm -hmm. I think what we've done is we've, we've explored a whole range of areas within a business, and we've touched on so many different parts. Um, I think, you know, we're talking about people, we're talking about processes, we're talking about plans, we're talking about power, we're talking about pivoting all the P's today um, and uh, business is having to change. If, if you have a, an aspiration of running a modern, uh, thriving, successful, um, ethical as well business, because let's not forget that um, we, we plunder the people and we plunder the planet at our peril. Sorry, I'm, it's all the P's today. Yeah, peril, people, process, plans. I know, and planets. Um, but uh, business is changing, and it's really impressing. Uh, there will be some businesses who can't be bothered. Now, can't tell me, mate. I know it all, and uh, we've been around since 1804, and we know everything. <laughs> okay. Uh, clearly, the two drivers for any business to change will always be fear and hunger. So if they are scared, if the senior management team is scared and is worried about the future and cannot be sure that everything will remain the same, then they will want to make changes. If they are hungry for success and growth, then they will, again, they will do what's required. If they're not hungry and they're not fearful, then they will sit and they will stagnate. That's very true. And uh, um, yesterday we decided to give uh, people the opportunity actually of having David's diagnostic equipment uh, uh, tool uh, to help them with their business. So we put everybody's name actually that's been on this call today in my lovely hat. Um, and uh, they're all in there, look, and we're going to take two out of here and I will contact those people at the end. Okay, so if I just take two out of this, just whilst we're on the call, we've got um, Ian Hutchinson and uh, Simon Chambers. So I will make sure that those two people have the opportunity um, of um, having a look at David's diagnostic tool um, for their particular business. So, uh, so sort of moving forward, um, moving forward from from the conversation we're having, we have actually recorded this short uh, piece um, and we'll be uh, putting that onto YouTube. So we will send that out again. It's always time. worth having a backup. You see, ah, oh, Beverly, you're back. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh, right. <laughs> Did I go again? Yeah. Um, so I shall. Um, yeah, I think we've got a bit of a sky issue in my house today. I'm just going to go and find out what's going on with it. Um, but um, just to say, um, I know that we need to round up. So thank you very much, David. It's been always a pleasure. Um, and I hope that everybody on the call today has found that useful. 
Um, is there anybody that would like to ask some questions in the chat or put your hand up and we can help? I think probably it's easier to go in the chat. Um, and, um, and as we said, the next session we'll be running will be on the 25th of, um, of February, uh, but that will be a lot more of an instructional um, session rather than just um, uh, rather than just an information session. So we'll be actually drilling down and looking at how you can actually implement those ideas into your own business. Any more from you, um, David? No, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, uh, whilst we were talking, I also had a DBD, DPD delivery. <laughs> We've had everything. The, I have to say the cats have well behaved themselves yes, yes, and the yeah, children. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, this, is, this is the modern world, but you know, it's been an absolute pleasure. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. I say this is, this is, a, this is the amuse bouche <laughs> what uh, Beverly and I are going to be coming up with. So many topics. So many things to talk about. It's all positive, it's all uplifting, and it's all about keeping us driving forward into this very unpredictable world we're living in. Thank yeah. you very much for thank your time you. today. Thank, thank you. you very much, everybody, and it's been a pleasure to have you all here. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.